What's a typical investment in Good Samaritan Capital? How much do you need? <laughs> 50K? Uh, yeah, yeah, 50K is the, usually the minimum we ask for. And you have to be a, um, what's they call by, it? By the way, who's who's asking? Because I, yeah, I need to make no, sure I'm SEC compliant and answering questions. <laughs> fair enough. I apologize for, and I know that I have my video off. I apologize about that. I kind of hit you from left field on that. No, my name, no I, I don't mind. I just got to make sure I follow the rules. Okay, well, so I'm David and I work for Intel. I'm okay. in Arizona. Okay. And have um, an investment with La Aubrey, property managers in California. I haven't heard of them. Oh, here's our speaker. Love it when they're early. <laughs> okay. Do you have to be an accredited investor? I, you don't have to be for, for most of the deals that I do personally, but you know what, since people are joining, let's, let's take the conversation offline. No problem. Thank you. Lindsay, great to meet you. Carmen's awesome. So I really want to thank her for introducing us. Um, I've known her for like two and a half years, maybe now. Um, uh, you're on mute. That would be helpful. I said, so nice to meet you. Excited to be here. And she's absolutely great. I'm actually picking her up from the airport in about two hours and meeting her in person for the first oh, you're, time. You're going down to the GoBundance conference. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. That's cool. I was really yeah. interested about it. I, I don't know much about GoBundance, but I, I think I personality wise would jive with the group. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you should look into it and let me know if it's something you're interested in. We can refer you, Carmen and I. There's a there's a okay. men's group and a women's group. So Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I heard There's about Nisi. it too. Hi. Hi, Nisi. So just for everybody's reference, on the Intel side, I've got 202 people registered. Um, we get up, actually, we've been trending down a little bit. We probably get 50% of that number usually. Um, but people will start joining and I have them all going into the waiting room. So I'm going to be sitting here <laughs> letting people in. Hi, Glenn. How come you're all? Oh, I thought you were in Mexico. <laughs> Dedication. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm. Actually, I'm. Oh, you still are, but you just decided to join. Dedication. <laughs> I realize I have a, I have a virtual background on. It's like maybe this will be better. Oh, we can't see. It's all white. Is that the? Is that the uh, beach? Oh, nice. Oh, there oh it is. no, we oh, can yeah. see that. Wow, what a nice view. You must have got bored of the beach, and that's why you're joining the group here. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Know the topic is short-term rentals, and I'm and I'm it in short-term rental, so I thought it was extremely apropos. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. I, I, I'm actually going through and acquiring my first short-term rental, also. Um, so, Daniel, real quick, as people are coming in, speaking to that, so it sounds like maybe you have a mixed group. People have short-term rentals already. People don't. How do you want me to um, gear the conversation? You know, it's a mixed bag. And okay. and I think, so Misi and uh, an, another uh, lady named Priya, who will be arriving soon, and I are the hosts. And so I, I think... Did did you say that you wanted to bring a slide deck or just I did I, I have okay. it? It's just very very short. I wasn't sure if that's how you, people usually. That's present. perfect. Okay. A, a lot of times we let people go for an hour or so, but we've been actually thinking about bringing that back so that um, so that it's a shorter slide period and maybe just more of a conversation with the yeah. three hosts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Misi said, bigger pocket style. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, you let me know. I don't think the slides, you know, depending on what the conversation is, but it's more to be interactive. Like I said, I kind of just threw them together last night when I could. So it's nothing crazy and then happy to talk. And then if you guys want to turn on to other conversations, just let me know and I can bow out and say thanks for having me and go from there. Carmen has mentioned you as like her Airbnb friends. <laughs> so I, I had no idea what that meant exactly other than you have short-term rentals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a couple. It's still a small group, so I'm just going to talk to that. So um, Lindsay, I have a property. I just haven't turned it on yet. So I'm coming okay. from that space. So. Okay, great, Bo. That's awesome. Nice to meet you. Hey, Bo, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm, get, I'm acquiring my first also. 
yeah, we'll both uh, run into the wall together and break it down. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, well, hopefully it'll be a small wall and I'm here to help you leap over it. Where are your, where's your rental at, Bo and Daniel? I'm in Arizona. I'm in the Phoenix area and mine's up in the White Mountains. So it's in the, in the forest area of okay. Arizona. Mine, mine's up at Sandpoint, Idaho, oh. uh, near Schweitzer um, and uh, Lake Pondere. We were looking in there. We couldn't quite find anything that fit for our timeline and budget, but I'll have to pick your brain later, Daniel, on what, what you ended up buying and where. Yeah. Um, Carmen can tell you all about it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. She, she's sure. actually partnering with me on it. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I also have one, but mine isn't really vacation specific. It's more convenience. It's on the other side of where I live. So <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Hey, it's all about, to me, it's all about the numbers. It's an investment. Yeah. Hello, everybody. We're going to wait for about five minutes after, as long as it's only one minute after. We're going to wait for a few more minutes to get some more people in here. I'm hitting admit in the waiting room as fast as I see them come in. But welcome to Real Estate Investing for Busy Professionals. My name is Daniel Homland. If you don't know who I am, uh, if, you, if this is your first time here, welcome. And we also have at your QMC. Sure. I wasn't sure if you wanted to um, introduce Lindsay right away already. Yeah, Missy here. I think I met some of you already. Um, I'm the uh, host for the Walmart Real Estate Investment Club. Yeah. And um, I'm excited about this topic today. Yeah. And also, uh, my company is called Life Mission Capital. Um, hey, Missy, Missy, let, let estate... me hit record really quickly. Sorry. You, it's recording already, he says. Oh. Okay, great. Go, sorry. <laughs> I guess. And uh, my company is uh, Life Mission Capital. And uh, we focus on real estate syndications as well, mostly multifamily right now. And uh, later in the year, we want to expand into different asset classes, including potentially short term rental as well. And we also have Priya. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good week, along with Daniel and me, C we sort of co-host this uh, series every week. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Um, my full-time job is to work in technology at uh, Netflix, but on the side, I'm also very interested and invested in real estate. Um, right now, I guess like our portfolio is a combination of multifamily and uh, long-term rentals, but it's very skewed towards multifamily. And uh, in addition to that, I also focus on raising capital for a bunch of syndication deals. So far, like we are co-GPs on over 700 units in Texas and Atlanta. Nice job scaling up, Rhea. <laughs> All right. And it looks like we're getting uh, about a quorum in here. We'll maybe take one or two more minutes and then we'll introduce our guest who is this way on my screen. I can do this. Uh, her name is Lindsay Lovell, and she's highly recommended by a mutual friend of ours. Um, but this is the first time I've met her, so she'll have to do her own introduction. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you kick it off, Lindsay? All right. So hello, everybody. My name is Lindsay Lovell. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and I started real estate investing during covid um, my W-2 job is um, I work for biotech companies in oncology as a sales person. Um, so when that happened, life came to a screeching halt and I had the wonderful blessing of a job that was uh, still paying us, but we weren't able to go out and do our job um, for a couple months um, and actually for quite a bit longer with uh, COVID and oncologists and my job being, a, being around patients who were immunocompromised. So um, I've always been a little bit um, type A, shall we say, uh, and always thought I'd just kind of climb the corporate ladder, right? I did the right thing, did undergrad, went and worked a couple of years in consulting and finance, private equity, went back to get my MBA um, and was chugging along thinking I was going to climb the ladder um, in marketing for biotech and um, you know, would check in on my wealth front, my little, you know, okay, as long as I keep putting this much in my 401k, I'll graduate on, you know, or I'll be able to retire in this state and was very, very risk adverse. Um, and then when I started bouncing off the walls during quarantine, my husband introduced me to um, a former colleague of his who had a couple hundred doors in Kansas City. Um, so fast forward a couple hundred 
bigger podcasts later, uh, lots of reading, getting connected with some great mentors. Um, 18 months later, we had scaled up to 36 stores and I had reached my financial freedom of re um, replacing my W-2 income. Um, I still work now because I love it and I'm passionate and I can balance both. Um, but I have since um, started a couple ventures. So I have my company Paxton Investments, which is uh, my um, properties I own with my husband. And those range from single family homes up to the largest we have there is an eight plex. Um, and then I started buying short term rentals in the Kansas City market. And um, I had to wrap my head a little bit around uh, why Kansas City coming from uh, being in the Bay Area and would love to jump in on that, especially since for those of you that are maybe in short term or jumping in, you hear all about the Smokies and the Gulf Shores and the glamorous markets. So would love to touch upon, you know, um, other markets out there and why it's important to keep your um, be open to a lot of different things. Um, so we are now up to seven short-term rentals there. Um, and then I started um, a syndication group with my partner. So my agent in Kansas City who was helping me identify and buy these said, you know what, we really have a, we have it down, right? I think all of us now, we know what things are in our wheelhouse and we've got this short-term rental down. We know, you know, what to do. Um, so we started a company called G6 Capital where we go out and we, put under contract two to four different houses, um, ideally in two to three different markets. And then we take it to um, our group of investors and say, who would like to buy into, we call it a fund, you know? So fund one, they were buying into a house in Kansas City, Missouri and a cabin in the Smokies. Um, fund two was a house in Kansas City, Missouri and two houses in Asheville. Um, so we're right in the middle of fund two. Um, and Dalton and I spent a lot of time looking at different um, areas and properties. And then our value to the investors is not only having that knowledge, but um, Dalton and I also started our own short-term property management company, Wanderlust, Cap uh, Wanderlust Stays. Uh, we have our first full-term, full-time employee, and we are currently onboarding our first full-time virtual assistant. So happy to chat a little bit about what it looks like to scale, because I never thought in a million years I'd be the need to hire people, right? It's a very sometimes weird, uncomfortable feeling. And there's that battle of, am I making enough money? Am I going to stop myself from making money if I don't do it? So I uh, went through sort of that mindset. Um, and we started that company in January. Currently, we are only managing our own 10 homes, um, but we've been asked by several people to take on some more. So we will soon be taking on clients for Wonderlist. Um, but for me, I'm not jumping at the idea of getting into property management as my business. I really want to continue to offer and do this um, short-term property uh, syndication. And we offer, you know, it's a passive investment for our investors. So they pay us very similar to Mincy. You said you do um, syndications for multifamily. You know, we charge an acquisition fee, get a certain percent of ownership, and then we manage it um, for the investors and it's completely passive to them. And they really like it because it's, sort of a way of, we pose it as a mutual fund. They're getting into different markets, different houses, short-term rental that they themselves may not have time to uh, manage or research or get started. Um, and so it's been really a big success. So I had that experience of, you know, having my own personal ones um, as well as now, you know, running it and managing um, for, for investors that are, um, you know, trusting and believing in me to bring it to life. So I'll pause there, kind of a long introduction. Um, and then I just have a, a couple of slides. Um, I connected with Daniel um, just about a day ago. So kind of put something together last minute when I was able to. So it's not a lot and really just here to um, hopefully help you guys and even learn from you as well. So um, I'll stop there. And if anybody has any questions, otherwise I'll um, share my screen if that works. I think we're a small enough group that you could take yourself off mute, but if you if you don't want to speak up, you can also put your questions in the chat and I will, uh, me or Misi or Priya will read them off to uh, Lindsay and I'll let other people go first, but I have questions. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'll start. Uh, you mentioned you talk about them as a fund. Do you, do you actually structure these legally as funds or, or are they partnerships? 
Nope. So they are legally structured with funds. So that was a fun um, learning experience. Uh, we do. So Dalton is my is my uh, business partner. So if you hear me refer to Dalton often, um, he and I interviewed and worked with um, syndication lawyers. Um, so have a resource for that if you um, if anybody's interested. And so, yes, there is legal paperwork. We are regulated in how we raise our money. So we do it as a 506 B. And I remember B as for brothers, meaning we can go to family and friends, but we cannot go out to people that we do not have some sort of relationship with. So if I post it on Facebook, it has to be for, for a very narrow group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's structured that way by our lawyers. If I wanted to go out and do it much more publicly. They would structure it differently. It has different steps and different um, sort of regulations and the amount of money that we can raise. But yes, and then we um, also invested in a software called Syndication Pro. So we have a portal where they formally log in, they can see the deals, and that will also do all of the payouts and calculate down to the you know nth percent of what somebody owns based on their buy-in, um, completely SEC um, compliant and regulated. So um, very much like a, a real syndication, just smaller assets. So syndication lawyers, is that Gene Trowbridge's group? Um, oh, it's so fine. Yeah, mind. I work with Nate Coons, so okay, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And, and then uh, the other question, are, is this a fund per property or are you describing a general, do you have an open-ended or blind pool fund where you describe we're looking for, you know, these types of short-term rentals with these characteristics and we're going to buy 10 of them? Yeah. So that's where we would like to go. Um, for our first two, since, you know, it's our first time getting started and, and, you know, we don't have a track record to prove, what we do is we put, you know, we search, we research, we do all this, you know, we put in offers and kind of once we put in that offer, it's a single family home. So we have a 30 day. So then we work real quickly in the next week and a half to find two to three more that we can put under contract so that they're all closing around the same amount of time. And then at the same time, we're going to our investors, building the pitch deck and saying, all right, here's the houses that we have under contract. Here's what you're buying into. Here's the total fund. And so each bundle of houses is a set fund. Um, in the future, and now we have so much excitement, so many people, you know, we had waiting lists for both raises that want to get in, that we probably will be able to go and raise the money beforehand and say, here's what we will target, here's the markets we're looking at for, who's in, and then come back to them when we do have some set. And someday I'd love to be able to take 10 down in a fund, but um, <laughs> not there yet. It doesn't take too long. No, just some, no. some good marketing and, and treating investors well. Exactly. Exactly. It's just that timing of getting 10 houses in the right market, the right deals, kind of under under contract in a similar amount of time. But you're right. There's always a way. Any yeah, questions? Daniel, I, uh, Lindsay, I had a question and I think Henry and I have similar questions. So I'm going to go ahead and combine that. So I think what Henry is asking is, what is the schedule at which investors get paid? And I'm going to leave you with a few things like, usually what is the hold period? And typically, I know returns are gonna be different and it's usually projected, but maybe give us a little bit on the returns and then the actual distribution schedule. Yeah, yeah. So um, it varies a bit in the amount of, obviously the amount you put down, um, how much debt, um, we decided on this last fund to take a pretty conservative approach just with everything going on. We literally, unfortunately launched this fund the day of the invasion. Um, and so we're funding 25% down, um, and we're also getting a commercial loan. We have a relationship with a bank in Kansas that will work with us, um, in all the U S, um, and they will loan to an LLC. So, um, our typical returns, um, the first fund, we are targeting an exit date of five years. Um, the second fund, um, it will be a 2x return at five years and a 2.3x percent uh, projected return at six years. So we asked everybody to have their commitment um, to consider this money committed for six years. So what happens is, say somebody needs out, right? Things happen and it's year three. Um, what the payout is for everybody, I'll back up. If you stay for all six years, every quarter after the first six months, so we take the first six months to get up, get stabilized, get it online, get reviews, all that stuff. After six months, the um, investors are paid out every quarter based on simply the vacation revenue. 
when we go to sell one to all of the homes, um, everybody, Dalton and I do not take a preferred ownership. We're in it with investors. So we own between the two of us, 30%, the investors own 70%. So say, for example, Priya, you bought in at 20% and we sold, um, and let's say we had you know, a million dollar back, you know, profit and every, all the equity we, we made in the um, homes, you would then get 20% of that. So 200,000 back plus all the dividends you had been getting that whole time. Um, and then obviously, um, or maybe not, obviously I'm not, I'm learning this as I go along. Um, we also are able to pass down that depreciation you know, so for the furniture, we work to do cost segs if it makes sense. So we can do bonus depreciation up front. Um, and typically, since limited partners, that's going to be a passive loss for you. That's something you can take against passive gains. So this investment and other investments. So we haven't yet uh, worked a model where we include depreciation into the projections because that's going to differentiate for every person. Um, but overall, for the first... Um, for the first fund, we were targeting um, about 15 to 17% cash on cash return for our investors. And that was not including the equity sale. Um, this fund, um, we worked with a different model with equity and everything out. We're predicting a 2.36% um, so double your money plus 36% and an average of a 1.18.8 uh, IRR. So average of 18.8 um, annual return each year. Awesome. Uh, Daniel, I see you're muted. So um, this, well, I have actually a question here and I think a lot of people are really interested in learning about kind of your experiences in scaling your short-term rental portfolio and also how you got started, especially when it comes to upfront capital, what's the best way to do it quickly for someone that's starting out? I think there is a lot of questions uh, around that. If you can talk a little bit about that, it'd be great. Yeah. So one of the best kept secrets, guys, um, is you can do a second home loan. So for those of you that own your primary, and forgive me, I haven't been in all your meetings, so maybe you know this, but one of the best things that my husband and I leverage is using the 10% down rule. So that means, and I, I, don't know exactly if it's the 60 mile radius or what the radius is, but I bought a house in the Smokies as my second home. Um, I was able to put 10% down because it's my second home. Then for the next year, I cannot buy anything in that 60 mile radius as a second home. But when that year is up, I can buy another home down the road for 10% down as another second home. So my husband and I put our loans separate so he can buy a second home in this area. I can buy a second home in this area. We did that in the Smokies. We then did that a month later in Kansas City, Missouri. We're about to do the same in Blue Ridge. So that is one method to get in having to use minimal cash down. Um, another great way if you're looking you know, for upfront capital um, and you don't own your primary, um, so maybe you're not eligible to do 10% down right away, um, Typically, lenders will do 20% down. Um, so working with a lender, finding that, that's you know, no surprise to you guys. There are new loans called DSCR. And I'm totally forgetting what that acronym stands for. But basically what they will do is they do not look at your DTI. They will look at your credit and they will base your loan and fund you off of the projected short-term rental. So, and there is... Um, a lender or two out there that are willing to do up to 15% or as low as 15% down, their points tend to be a little bit higher. Um, the lender is one, um, Sprout, um, I'm going to say I just talked to another lender friend of mine who put some people through the lender and they were not big fans, um, but Sprout is the one he recommended for me. Um, in terms of gaining capital, um, you know, starting off, I myself partner a lot. We heard Daniel, for those of you on the call earlier, huh. um, you know, at this point I am, um, had people reach out and say, you know, they have the money. They don't necessarily have the DTI. Either I can do it with them or, you know, I match them up with people that maybe have the DTI, but not the down payment, um, hard money loans. I'm sure that's something you guys have talked about. Um, if you don't have it, 
Um, happy to you know dive a little bit more into that, but I don't want to go into something if you guys have already covered hard money loans, but those are things not directly from the bank, private individuals. Um, my husband and I do hard money loans out of our self-directed uh, 401k. Um, wholesaling is another way that people get started and save money for um, a down payment. Um, so I hope that answered the question of who was kind of asking about how do I how do I finance these. Um, full transparency, when I started um, and got my 36 doors, I was doing the Burr method. So I was able to take the money that I had saved and, and roll it along and use um, it to snowball the effect. Um, and now I'm at the point where um, I can raise money to do it um, and not necessarily always need my own money. Yeah, thank you. Daniel, I know you have a sad <laughs> message you have to give to the crowd here. I, I was going to say, Lindsay, I, I hope your experience is different than mine. But uh, last week, I went to three different lenders and I got the news that Fannie Mae is clamping down on the second home mortgage uh, program. And they said it's 25% down. Uh, for, really? And, and that was just as of, uh, I got the news last week, but they said it changed to like like three weeks to a month ago. So, uh, because because so many investors were doing it that that they considered them they said all these people are doing investment loans and so we need to go with the investment loan rules and it needs to be 25 percent down um and yeah. they might lighten up in the future but they might and that's interesting because i heard that and then i asked two of my lenders and they said no so oh, well, who are your lenders i'll go keep to asking too. <laughs> keep asking right and yeah. that's kind of one of my biggest things that i learned is call every local bank call every local credit union yeah. I, I called yeah. uh, Chase Bank and then two local banks okay. and and got that. But um, I can keep calling. Yeah. Yeah. Keep keep calling. That's good. You know, and I'm curious because I've heard that. And then I have somebody I mentor that's closing with a 10 percent down. So uh, I don't know, but that's, so that's good to hear. Maybe the message to the group is, is that if you hear no at first, keep trying. Yes. Yes. Right. Lindsay, I, well, I wanted to follow up on your question about how you and your husband both took out loans, and that's really smart uh, to do that, especially for people who are married or even just partnership with others. How many times can you do that? Um, can you do it every year? Because with house hacking and different things, there is usually, usually like a certain amount of period required, maybe a year. Uh, is it similar in second home? Um, so when you're purchasing um, with Fannie and Freddie, and let's just say you are doing the typical 25% down or 20% down, you can do up to 10 loans in your name. So if my husband and I were partnering and always putting our names on both loans, we'd be capped at 10. So we always split it up. So between the two of us, we can do 20, but we also have to have the DTI to do 20. So if we went and bought a $2 million home, me on one, and you know, my DTI is completely shot on there. Yeah, I could do nine others, but a conventional Fannie and Freddie is not going to let me loan on DTI. Now I mentioned the bank that I work with and they don't care about my DTI. They're a little bit higher on their interest rates, um, but they will go ahead and loan um, regardless. And it doesn't matter to them, at least not thus far, how many loans we have. So kind of like I said, look beyond the, the big Wells Fargo and the PNC. Um, to Daniel's point, I literally spent two weeks and have a list of every single bank, every credit, you know, of all the different states um, I invest in to finally find somebody that would, you know, do a line of credit on an investment home. Um, somebody else in my mastermind um, found banks that they will loan credit just to your LLC. So he got $20,000, $30,000 line of credit with smaller banks just by saying, hey, I just started this LLC, what line of credit will you give me? So that's another great thing. Again, he didn't even have to have anything else um, besides that. And he did that with three different banks. Now he has, you know, 30, 45,000 um, that he can use and put down in his business. So that's another thought that I didn't think about when you're asking about how to how to save it. So and also thinking about like asset protection and whatever and see to your point. Heaven forbid something happened on one of the houses. It's good that only my husband or only I am on it for repercussions. Right. Say something happened. We went bankrupt on that loan. It's just me and my credit score versus both of ours. Yeah. 
de definitely. And since you're on that topic, um, just wanted to add that I was at an asset protection meeting workshop, and it's also good to put uh, those assets, even it's under your personal name, and transfer it to a trust and serious LLCs for further protections. Of course, that's another topic, but people should definitely research into it. It's really good to protection against lawsuits and limited liabilities. Absolutely. So I work with a uh, asset manager. Since I'm in California, she recommended a series LLC. So to your point, every property we buy is a different series within that. And to your point, even when we buy it after the deal is done, we'll deed it over into the LLC out of our personal name. So exactly. And such an important thing to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I wanted to add um, to the DTI ceiling. So I've hit that, but uh, Fannie Freddie loans also provide for um, uh, what's kind of called an offset. So for example, if you were to buy um, a property that had like, a, a, let's say a $750 a month mortgage, and your rents were a thousand, then that actually wouldn't apply against your DTI at all. So as long as you're buying smart and uh, you're getting the right rent rates, then you can actually buy unlimited um, up to your 10 cap is what you, you talked about. So just sharing that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And then there is also some lenders that will look at, so I bought the house under my name, Lindsay Zane, but yet the mortgage is being paid out of my Paxton Investments business account. If I can go back and show that for the last 12 months, somebody else has been paying it, not me, lenders will sometimes also take that off as counting against your DTI. So same with like a car, you know, car I think is also counted on your DTI, et cetera, et cetera. If you can show that, you know, maybe a parent or a cousin or somebody else or your LLC has been paying um, the loan on that, um, make sure to ask your lender, hey, can I get, you know, this car or this house taken off counting towards my DTI? And I think I saw it pop up. I think somebody answered it, but DTI means um, debt to income. So however much you make, you can only be leveraged up to a cer certain percent. And I'm, I don't know off the top of my head what Fannie and Freddie is. Um, I forget if it's 20 or 30. I don't know if anybody knows off the top of your head, but that's how they, how they look at it. It's 40. And they can stretch up to 50. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Bo. Okay. So moving on to the next question. And Lindsay, by the way, we should catch up. I live in the Bay Area too. So oh, I I'll, love that. Yeah, I'll ping you after. Okay. We should catch up. Wonderful. Do you live in San Francisco or uh Larkspur. We just moved up to Larkspur. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so here is an interesting question that is probably top of my mind too. Uh, so Vera here is asking, how do you determine a location for SDRs? And then how do you find realtors who are educated on short-term rentals? Excellent, excellent question. Um, so first and foremost, um, I heard this. So there's a great uh, gentleman, he's got a Facebook group following, um, his name is Bill Faith, it's F-A-E-T-H, and he's one of the, like, the gurus in short-term rentals, and I heard him say on a podcast, if it's a market that everybody's talking about, write it down on your list of do not invest in, because that probably means it's going to be oversaturated or, you know, already there. Um what I found is if you're smart and if you, I don't, I don't want to say I would work about anywhere, but if you're smart and you work with a real estate agent, you can have, and you pick the right property and set it up right. You can have a short-term rental in a lot more places than you would think. To my point, I've lived in San Francisco, New York, Florida. I've always been kind of in the coast. So when somebody said, you should do a short-term rental in Kansas City. I was like, you're, you're crazy. Why would anybody vacation there? No offense to anybody living there, but it was just not where you typically think that's where a family's going to pick up and go and vacation. But um, there are lots of reasons, especially for people that are not like me and crazy coasters, um, to go to a city like that. The hospitals, the Chiefs games, bachelorette parties, going back. So by having an agent there that knew here's where the areas that people are going to travel to, here's the path of progress where they're putting in a light rail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
we can pick out pockets where it would work there. Another great way is, um, and I can show this on my slides, but there's um, a lot of tools called Air DNA, um, Rabu, R A, I can never remember if it's B B U or B U U dot com. It's free. Um, that has, you can put in the address. So all of these, you can put in the address or pull up market reports. Um, and then there's also MASH, MASH Pfizer. So MASH Pfizer and AirDNA are both paid, paid services and they can be kind of expensive, but you can go on there, you can put an address, you can put you know, a general zip code and it'll pull up all this data and they both sync to Airbnb, VRBO and booking.com. So you can get a general idea of narrowing down to a market, narrowing it down to a neighborhood, et cetera, um, to where you want to be looking at rental potential. Now I see somebody, you know, popping up, Byron, absolutely. So you want to be careful, right? Because I don't know how many of you are familiar, you know, up here in Tahoe, a lot of people had vacation rentals and all of a sudden the city decided no and just shut it down. So you want to make sure that that's where you're also looking and researching what the short-term rental regulations are. And to the point of whoever asked, finding an STR savvy realtor. Um, to find an STR savvy realtor, one, you know, reach out to somebody like me or somebody else that you know um, that might have connections. Um, go on bigger pockets. I'm a strong believer that every market I've entered, whether I was going long term, burr, whatever, always started with my agent as the nucleus. If I can pick up an agent and say, who would you as a contractor? Where would you go? Da, da, and if they can answer those questions, I'm set. Um, so I typically start in bigger pockets uh, and you don't have to have a membership to just go on there and search for different brokers in a market. And then I, I speed dial. A, who calls me back in a timely manner. B, who sounds savvy and you know happy to provide some questions. But you know at this point, you can, you can ask, you know, do you short-term rental? And I would maybe just say, do you have an STR? See if they even know what that acronym means. If it doesn't, probably not your agent. Um, you know, do you, what do you use for your sources? If I told you I'm looking at XYZ house, how much do you think it's rev par would be? And that's, I don't even know what that stands for, but it means uh, revenue um, per evening average. So even if you don't totally know the lingo by just sort of throwing some of it out there, if they know, Again, you're golden. Um, going on to Facebook groups for that market. At this point, there seems to be a Facebook group for just about everything. So if you're interested in Miami, Google Miami short-term rentals, join that Facebook group, post on there, and you will get all the information you need. So I think I answered that question. Let's see, what do yes. you think? Oh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I was just going to follow up on one of the things you said about um, the laws and regulations, because at this point, uh, we still don't know at the federal level, even at state or county level, how people really feel about like Airbnb, VRBO, because it's still somewhat new and we really don't really 100% understand the impact of it has on a city or a town. Um, so I just think it's so important to underwrite based on long-term long rental and not really like over purchase paying much higher price because you're like saying okay i'm gonna get five thousand dollars a month in profit because of your dna data but try to under it uh, conservatively make sure the bills can be paid and you can make some profit as a long-term investment as well absolutely i think you know foundational rule for any investment have an exit plan right so we would never buy something that couldn't cover the mortgage long-term. And the nice thing about MASH Advisor is they actually will give you data to your point and see on both the long-term potential and the short-term potential if you subscribe to that. So you can also figure out, all right, if I buy this house and I do have to flip it to long-term, what, what would that look like? Um, and that's probably another part of our investment strategy in terms of I am very selective about where I purchase versus maybe where I would want to live in terms of, you know, what the government allows and doesn't allow. Um, that is one thing, you know, when you are narrowing down, it is a nice to have in the sense of a place that is uh, tourism dependent or has some 
part of its economy that's tourism uh, focused because to Mincy's point, they're gonna most likely be, not always, but most likely be more friendly to short-term rentals and understand the importance of that. But again, not guaranteed. So 100% always, you're gonna always do your research. Um, one of the best things you can do is also see if you can find somebody that sits on some counties will have um, boards that represent short-term rentals that sort of liaison and work with the city council to you know talk about regulations and governments and all that stuff. And that's something that you should be asking your agent about for sure. All right. So I, I had a question about property management and I see, I see that uh, Kaushika also has a question about it. Um, what do, what do you, how do you go about evaluating a property manager? And I'll, I'll bring this home here. We're, I'm looking at using evolve.com. Uh, I know they're popular and they're nationwide. And do you, do you like things like that or not? And how do you go about finding a property manager? Yeah. So my experience was a little different in the sense of, um, I started in Kansas city, Missouri. I was already pretty networked there. Um, full transparency. The first person I hired to do property management was not a good fit. Um, I would recommend, so there's also a lot of, um, not third party, like evolve. I don't know if they do this, but some local places will also offer not only to manage, but to set up your, your Airbnb, right? So go in, they've got the checklist. They know, you know, exactly the cameras, the bed types, the sheet, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I'm going to say, if you go that route, it's great, but get in writing a contract that says they're going to show you the receipts and you're going to be, you know, just be very clear on whether they're marking you up or if you're getting, you know, at cost or plus their setup fee. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so I had somebody local managing all of mine and then going into each new market that we were at, um, they charged a flat fee, which at first I was like, oh, this is amazing. Cause our, you know, Smokey's cabin is supposed to do 170,000 and 10% of that is 17,000. You know, that's a lot to be paying to a property manager. Um, what we quickly learned and why we decided to spin it off and start our own is nobody takes care of your own business better than you do. Second to that though, is somebody that's getting paid a flat rate is probably not as motivated as somebody that's getting a percent of the cut. If you have a last minute cancellation, Thanksgiving weekend to work hard to get somebody in there versus somebody who's getting paid regardless. Um, I, interestingly enough, was just talking to the agent that I just connected with to um, start looking in blue, the Blue Ridge market. And she mentioned that she uses Evolve and really likes them. Um, I think there's a company called Vacasa that I haven't heard great things about, but again, that's just that's just me. Um, and then there's often local people in the market. Uh, I think you have to really weigh the thoughts on, it is very possible. It is very possible to self-manage from a distance. I wouldn't say I would wanna self-manage more than one or two without um, having a lot of flexibility and knowing it's going to be work. And then at that point, there's a certain sort of tech stack that I'm happy to get into um, that's on my slides that you probably want to make your life easier. Um, but at one or two, you can easily manage it yourself if that's what you want. Or if you want that passive, just count those numbers into, you know, when you're underwriting it, but you will find companies charging up to 35%. So, you know, that's where you have to kind of weigh. And I would, I would just talk to a lot of people. I talk to people that use Evolve, that use Vicasa, that use, you know, local, and then people that self-manage and, and kind I, of go from there. I, I need to talk to more people before I decide on them, but I, and I heard their, their, their sales pitch here, right, the initial call, and I was fully expecting to not be impressed. And when I went in there, the, the two things that really struck me was, is that most of the local vendors that I talked to wanted year long contracts and they were month to month. And they, they were only charging 10% of the uh, income, yeah. which I was shocked at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was expecting really 30%. Low. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of thought, well, you know, if it's a month to month contract, if they don't work out, I could always switch. And that's kind of where I am. But I do need to talk to more people in the area and, and understand them better. One of the things to think about, too, whenever you go with a thing, are they going to put you under their profile? 
or will they manage your profile? Because think about it. If you've been building up credibility and reviews under their profile and then you split with them, you're starting from square one. If they're willing to manage under yours, you've gotten super host, you want to split from them, you're not held hostage. Good point. Now yes. a question here from Vera and another good question. So she's asking, what do you consider a good minimum cash flow when evaluating an SDR after all the expenses and management fee and all of that is paid? And is there a good calculator that you would recommend? Yeah. So um, in terms of a good cash flow, I want to say it's up to your goal. Um, I've heard certain people in my other mastermind say 20%. I'm not even going to look at it if it's under that. Um, I had an agent say, you know, if it's under 15%, I'm not going to look at it under that. Um, I think the whole point that we do and take on the hassle, the headache, the, it's a higher risk. You know, Lindsay's brought up some things about government regulation, whether it books or not, how people review, it's a higher workload, higher risk. You're not guaranteed to get that, you know, excellent cash flow, but you're definitely not going to get that long term. So it's, you know, a little bit more of a, of a reward. Um, so, you know, if you're making eight, nine, 10% on your long terms, why take on a short term that's doing that much, right? Um, but that's also up to you, right? And there's Bill Faith. I've been very inspired listening to him lately. He has like 10 doors only and he nets like 700K off of them. Now, to my point a little bit earlier, he's, doing a lot of research and he's going into markets that aren't the Smokies and already, you know, he's getting in and getting good deals and using that data, being smart and kind of looking at what's up and coming instead of getting caught up in the rat race of I'm going to buy in the Smokies because everybody's smiling there. And I can say that because I did that. And I think hopefully I got in just at the right time, but you know, I'm not bashing on anybody only because, you know, I got up in that craze. Um, so, um, you know, it's really kind of up to you, but I would say, you can hold yourself higher accountability wise um, in terms of what you would make. And kind of going back to Bill Faith, you know, he goes luxury, right? So he puts a lot of money in, he does amazing things, and he's really focused and targeted to make those 10 doors make a lot of money for him, right? So he's also put a lot of money in. These aren't houses he's buying for 250000 and furnishing all from Ikea. Yeah. Hey, you Oh, really, really quickly, I, I threw the spreadsheet into the chat that I, I just threw this together. It's a quick spreadsheet that we're using to evaluate them. I would love open source style if you want to use it or if you want to suggest improvements, feel free. Uh, but it's there if you want to use it. Yeah, so along that line real quick, I'm sorry, I'm just going through my, um, my slides and maybe it might be helpful to bring it up real quick if you want just to, so for my slide on running the numbers, um, if you go to, oh, when you're talking about finding a, an agent, there's a group called the short-term shop run by Avery Carl. Um, they're in a lot of markets and on their website, they have a free calculator. Um, I use something for all of my rentals called deal check. Dot io it doesn't have a specific short term rental but you can use it you know you just put in all the different um expenses more detailed um it's great i love it uh it calculates out you know up to 20 years all of that kind of stuff and i think it's like 19 dollars a month um so you can just use their rental um calculator in that spits out a really nice report too always nice to send to your bank. Um, but yeah, to Daniel's point, there's probably a lot of people at this point that are willing to share their calculators. Any other questions? I haven't looked at the chat in a little bit here, or did everybody just dive on my spreadsheet? Yeah. There's a lot of people on it right now. <laughs> um, one question that just came in about like using virtual assistants. So the question is, uh, you mentioned virtual assistants. Can you expand on that? I guess they're looking to understand how exactly you're using them to scale your business. Yeah, so um, we have a full-time employee, but uh, full-time typically is nine to five, right? Mondays through Fridays, but Airbnb is 24 seven. Um, so we worked with, there's a lot of different um, virtual assistant companies out there. Um, 
I've used a couple. Um, the one that we ended up going with is called Cyberbacker, and they work with individuals um, in the Philippines. Um, for $1,500 a month, they will work 40 hours during whatever hours we, we set for them. Um, they go through a 10 day training course on, you know, all the different things we mentioned, we'd want them to use Canva, VRBO, um, PowerPoint. Um, we went through interviews and picked this individual, told them what we were looking for. Um, there's some uh, VA companies that you just simply sign up and they'll sign you somebody and they'll say you can only talk with them, you know, through Spike, uh, Skype and through chat. Um, and at that point, you're probably paying close to like eight to $10 an hour for their work. Um, there's also VA companies where it's people based here in the US. So if you want somebody on the same time zone, um, Chatter Boss is someone there. They're a little bit more expensive, but you can have somebody at the partner level, uh, $50 an hour, somebody at more junior for $25 an hour. And basically it really is for whatever you need them to do, right? You're going to want to be very specific in your job request. Um, I use mine for, I have one assistant that just does all my, I use Stessa initially for my accounting. I'm moving away because I've gotten too big, but I send her the receipts and just say, um, hey, Nina, this house, this category, money out. And she puts it into Stessa and categorizes it and you know gets it all in that system. And so that was one of the first things I needed to get off my plate was just the administration with bills and all that kind of stuff. Um, another assistant um, will call and set up utilities. You know, that's one of the bummers of buying single family homes is everyone you buy, you got to call and set up water, sewer, da, da. So at this point, I just have her call all that. Um, hey, I need insurance for this short term rental and this. Please go get quotes for me and decide which is the best one. Um, I have another one I've been asked to teach a boot camp for. Um, another mastermind eight week boot camp, and she's helping me pull together and create what each week's content is going to look like. Um, so you can really go from very skilled to, to pretty basic. Um, there's a lot of different groups out there. There's a lot of companies. It's pretty impressive that are based solely on one person. And then all, everybody that works for them are VAs. So it's becoming much more and more of a norm thing. Um, so like I said, Cyberbacker is the one that I um, would probably recommend off the bat is like a very reasonably priced um, and so far pretty impressed with what they've provided. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I think someone else asked specifically what's the name of the VA company, um, if you want to share that. Yeah, <laughs> so the VA company is um, Cyberbacker, one word, so C-Y-B-E-R-B-A-C-K-E-R. -E okay. And tell them Lindsay Lovell referred you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, so there's that's the one that um, it, it's in the Philippines. It's fifteen hundred for forty hours a week and uh, one thousand for twenty hours a week. Uh, it's a one year commitment, seven hundred and fifty dollars setup fee. Um, there's one called Chatter Boss, and that's where they're based here in the U.S. It's a little bit more um, expensive. Uh, a little bit more white gloved, um, just depends on, you know, time zones, how you want to work it. Um, I'm also using them to run my social media. So they have both the like personal assistant on the business side, and then a group of ladies that's rocking it in terms of um, social media campaign, etc. So that's another thing you can hire a VA to post for you to, you know, any anything and everything that can be done virtually, um, besides like, giving them access to your bank account to pay bills and that kind of stuff is, is the one thing that you don't want to offload and that they won't take on. Yeah. Yeah. And I also love working with the virtual assistants. I typically uh, like working with the ones in, in the Philippines. Uh, I found their English to be really good. And also uh, when they actually speak on the phone, their accent isn't as strong. So it's easier for customers to understand as well. Um, I also have a recommendation in case anyone uh, wanted to just use um, the uh, company. It's called Infinity Web Solutions, and they have really good rates as well, and they're very well-rounded, uh, $4 an hour. They have a big group, a few hundred people as well. Um, I've worked with two of the people there, and they're all very good and positive. And, yeah, very, very positive people. I love that. Um, one question I've been meaning to 
ask you when you were talking was about uh, luxury style. So we know that during pandemic, uh, you know, the hotels really took a hit, especially the luxury style. Of course, Airbnb, you have your own place. It's separate from other people who are renting it. Um, but how do you see upcoming recessions that would affect uh, luxury rentals or short-term rentals in general? But within short-term rental, you also have different ranges. I feel like with um, hotels, hotels are here to stay. And uh, the competition is more with the um, economy-style hotels. But with the unique stays uh, within Airbnb, it's hard to really do that from a hotel standpoint. So just wanted to see your perspective about hotels as a competitor and also recession. Yeah, I mean, hotels, you have to think about, you know, what's around there. I probably wouldn't go buy a single family home across from the Courtyard Marriott, right? Unless you're going to have, it's very different. It can sleep, you know, it has five bedrooms because that's going to be a very different demographic that you're competing for um, than, you know, the typical business traveler, right? Um, so one of the things to think about is Airbnbs are always going to beat out hotels in the sense of maybe if you're traveling um, in a large group that wants to be together, bachelorette parties, reunions with the kitchen, um, also people with small kids. If you start to think about the option of you put the kids to bed, if you don't have a separate room, what do you do? So I think there will always be the demand for Airbnb, especially now that people have been more and more exposed to them because of the pandemic. Um, but it's a different it's a different traveler, Mincy. So again, you would really want to look at that Air DNA data and see who's who's being driven there. You know, is it families? How are the Airbnbs um, around them renting out? And then one of the cool things you can do on like Air DNA and Rabu and Mash Pfizer is you can pick comps, right? So if you're like, all right, here's what I'm thinking in terms of luxury. How many A? How many other ones are you know? $4,000 a night, but because it's this big, beautiful, all glass overlooking Joshua tree. So you're also going to want to see what your competition is there and exactly thinking about, you know, my coach calls it the avatar. So what exactly are you trying to track in your customer and that you are marketing to? Um, I think there'll always be hotel and um, STRs together. Um, whether the hotel industry would agree with that, I don't know. But like in Asheville, when you pull up their city council report, they look at both trends of their hotel stays and their STR stays because they see them both as supporting their tourism. So again, it's doing your research. Um, I think it's really important, um, especially now, travelers are thinking more and more and paying attention to the amenities. So something we're adding to all of our STRs are a waffle bar and a coffee bar you know, with different types of coffee, different coffee, you know, French press, pour over, et cetera, et cetera, because they're focusing on the amenities. So you want to make sure you can go in and be different from all the other Airbnbs. You know, with the recession, um, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. Um, for the people that had STRs through this recession, uh, it was terrifying at first, and then they've basically straight out crushed it since then. Yeah, it was more the COVID that crushed the business first, but once, yeah, uh, yeah it got back later. Daniel. Oh, I, mm -hmm. oh, I was going to say, Muin has a question about how do you furnish your SDR? Yeah, so we, up until this first one that we closed on beginning of this week, have always um, either the cabins in the Smokies came pre-furnished, and then in Kansas City, we were um, using the Airbnb man B &B manager that we had before. We now, at this point, know what needs to be bought. Um, and it's pretty simple. There are so many um, websites out there at this point that will give you the list. And it's not rocket science. Anybody that's ever moved into an apartment or home on their own outside of their parents, I'm going to guess that's pretty much all of us on this call, knows what needs to go into a house. Um, it's just maybe small things that you didn't think about in terms of cameras for security, um, keyless entry, maybe thinking about putting everything on Nest so you can control the thermostat um, from a distance because if you don't, you get a pipe burst lesson learned, you know, in the winter, if somebody cancels last minute, they're not staying. Um, but there's so many templates now at this point that we just, um, 
my partner's wife took it on and she just has a spreadsheet. She, you know, orders this many towels, this many things. And what's really nice is now every house we go to, we can kind of just reuse that and just scale it up, up or down for towels, bed sheets. And then you add kind of a little bit more flair, but um, it's, it's pretty easy. I think the hardest part is the logistics, right? Like having a couch show up if you don't own the house yet, or if you're not there, um, what I've heard of some people do is ordering it all to their house or whoever's going to decorate for them and then loading it up into um, a U-Haul and bringing it out there. You can pay for services like that um, if it's not in your back door or you, um, you know, buy from a local store and just set up, you know, the bigger pieces to all arrive when you're there for a week setting it up yourself type of thing. So it's, it's a little bit tricky on the um, logistics um, but it is not rocket science and what you actually have to do. I think just the logistics is the hardest. And there's so many people out there now, this is such a business industry that you could probably find somebody in just about every market that offers that service of setting it up for you. All right, just a, a warning. We've got a four minute warning until the meeting ends. Does anybody else have any other questions? I think there's one in the chat about uh, for you personally, do you pay a decorator to kind of put things together or do you do the physical work yourself? Um, so kind of what we are doing in Asheville, we're paying, um, my agent is also a short-term rental management company. So we're paying them. Um, they're buying everything. They're putting in a cart, we approve, and then they're going to put it all together and they have a team and we pay them um, a certain fee for that. Um, you can have a decorator if you want, like I said, my uh, partner's husband, partner's wife is putting it together. Um, so it's really up to you on what you want to do it. Like I said, there's so many templates now and you could probably maybe even find somebody's Pinterest that has, you know, how they decorated the Airbnb and copy and copy and share. Um, so um, yeah, it's really how, how you want to do it. I've never hired a professional decorator, just people that have done this before. And Lindsay, we always want people to share their, our speakers to share their contact information so that if they want to contact you, Absolutely, they can. I would love that. Which I think that'll cover some of the more specific questions about your deals that we're getting in the chat. Yeah, so I'll put my um, email in um, the chat. And then, um, like I mentioned, I uh, am getting started at my social media, I mentioned I hired somebody. And so if you guys all want to really impress my social media coach and um, follow me on Instagram, um, you have no idea how thrilled that would make me. Um, but don't judge because like I said, um, I'm just getting that started. Um, so there's my Instagram, there's my um, email. I will also put my phone number on there. Um, feel free to call, text, always happy. I'm, I'm where I'm at because a lot of people have helped me along the way. Um, and people will continue to help me, um, and grow. And I like to do it back. I think my mentor put it best. Think of like, you know, what was that game barrel of monkeys where, you know, everybody kind of reaches down as you go up and help somebody else up and we all, all get there together. So definitely have that mindset, happy to help however, um, you can, uh, or however you need. And the, the slide deck that you were referring to, um, is there any possibility you would share that with this group? Yeah, uh, yeah. If it's, Daniel, if it's not ready, you know. No, I mean, it's, to, it's, but. it's nothing amazing. Like I said, I put it together, but it at least has the tech stack, like what are the software pieces that we're using to, to manage um, our properties and has the name of like Rabu and Air DNA and all that kind of stuff. So most of it I've talked about, um, but yeah, more than happy. Just don't expect anything amazing, but I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you, Daniel, if you then want to um, send it out to everybody. Is that best? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put it want. in the Facebook group Perfect. if that Perfect. works for you. Great. And my, my kids just informed me that you should call it the Insta. <laughs> instead of Instagram. I don't know. Insta anyway. or, or, or IG is, is Insta. Oh, I, I had, I did my first TikTok yesterday, <laughs> everybody. I sweat bullets. So I'm out there. So follow me on TikTok too, if you're, if you're kind enough. Hey everybody, <laughs> could you. you take yourself off mute and thank Lindsay for coming in and talking to this group.
Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Priya, please reach out. Daniel, thanks for reaching Thank out to the deck and uh, hope to connect with some of you guys again. Talk soon. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yes, yes.